In this session, we're going to look at the consequences of the fall. What happened to the biological world through time? In particular, what happened to the natural evil in the biological world as time progressed? With the fall and the curse that followed it, the creation began to age. Not just the biological world, but in fact the entire creation. It says in Hebrews, the earth, the heavens, all these things wax old as doth a garment. Not only did organisms, individual organisms, begin to degenerate after they grew up to adulthood, degenerative aging, but in fact the entire creation begins to wear out, to wear down. So that in the end, God is going to have to recreate the heavens and the earth to restore them to the condition they were in before the fall. Another thing that happens with this, uh, with the curse and begins to change with the curse is that organisms before the fall had no genetic mistakes. They had no, uh, no errors in, their, uh, in the programs that uh, God had placed in them. But with the fall, mistakes began to enter the system. Mistakes that, as we shall learn in a future chapter, are called mutations, errors, in the copying of genetic information from one generation to the, to the next, begin to accumulate. Before the fall, presumably those things were all corrected and that organisms had no imperfections in their instructions on how to build organs, how to repair organs, and so on and so forth. But after the fall, the mistakes began to accumulate. And uh, in biology, we have a special name for the list of mistakes that have accumulated in an organism that might do harm to the organism. And that term is, a genetic, is called genetic load. Our genetic load, let's say my genetic load, would be all those mistakes or instructional mistakes that exist in my body that would do me harm. They are mistakes that, uh, on how to repair things, how to build organs, how to, uh, uh, even how to operate, even how to uh, behave, that uh, there have been some changes in those instructions and now those things are done differently and they, they cause suffering, they cause harm to me. All of those mistakes accumulate to make up my genetic load, the total amount of uh, harmful information that exists in my body. Every organism has a certain genetic load, accumulated mistakes that have, uh, that have been added to the system since the creation. If it's been a very, very long time since the creation, if it's uh, been sufficiently long, the mistakes will have accumulated to the point where an organism will simply die because there's too many mistakes. It doesn't have enough correct information to know how to live, to, to repair itself, and so on and so forth. In fact, what we understand about mutations, mistakes in genetic information, at any given site in the DNA, there's basically one chance in a million, roughly, that a mistake will occur at that, at that place, which means that in a million generations, you would expect a, a mistake to be made at every single location of the, uh, on the DNA, which would mean that in a million generations, you should lose all of your information and the organism would certainly be dead. Well, a million generations, if, you, if your generation time is at one year, if you live for a year and have, a have an offspring, which is the case with most organisms, then in a million years, Organisms shouldn't exist. They should be dead. Their mutational load would be so great that organisms couldn't survive at all. What we actually see out in the world about us, with looking at humans and looking at plants and at animals, it doesn't look like any organisms are, actually have a genetic load so great that they're going extinct or about to go extinct. Now, actually, we don't have the ability right now at this stage to count how many mistakes there are. So we don't know what the actual genetic load is, but it doesn't look like organisms have accumulated so much of a genetic load that they're in danger of going extinct. So in fact, they look quite healthy, which suggests that not much time has elapsed 
from the beginning uh, the, for organisms uh, to accumulate genetic mistakes. And it suggests also that they started out with no genetic mistakes, and it hasn't been much time since then. So the genetic load uh, is increasing through time. The lack of genetic load in the present suggests that not much time has elapsed. We also have, following this event uh, of the curse, disease is going to increase. There's more disease every day than there was previously. There's more genetic mistakes that are causing organisms to break their mutualistic relationships. Disease is going to increase through time. The fact that we have what appears to be a very low genetic load in, among organisms, and the fact that diseases haven't become so common as to obliterate life, suggests it hasn't been much time since the beginning for mutations to accumulate, and that life started out with no mutations in the beginning. This is consistent with the young age creationist perspective of life. Life isn't very old, it's only thousands of years old, and when God created it initially, there were no mistakes in the system. There were all mutualistic, beneficial relationships between and among organisms. There were no harmful relationships among organisms. This is not consistent with a naturalistic perspective of the world, which believes that organisms have been around for millions, in fact, hundreds of millions of years, and that in the beginning they didn't even start out perfect in the beginning. That would, should result in organisms having already reached a genetic load which has obliterated them or made them extinct. The fact that organisms seem to be healthy suggests that life is not old and it was created in a perfect form in the beginning which is consistent with what the Bible tells us. And it's inconsistent with naturalism. What is our responsibility as priests with this kind of information? First of all, our responsibility as priests is to better know God. The more we study the biological world, the more we study uh, mutualism, the more we study even natural evil, the more we learn about the God who created it. First of all, as we learn more and more about the, uh, the depth and the uh, ubiquity of mutualism, the more we are impressed with God's goodness. He has established these awesome relationships which allow organisms to persist together mutually for very long periods of time, for in fact thousands of years uh, in, in mutualistic relationship. That's consistent with the idea of a God who is good. We also have a spectrum of perfection of mutualism in the world. Uh, we've got some organisms that don't seem to interact with each other at all, or very infrequently, or for very short periods of time, other organisms that interact for longer periods of time, other organisms that interact for a long period of time, but they do just a little bit of benefit for each, each other, and then other organisms that interact for long periods of time and so are so interwoven in their uh, existence with one another that they seem to be a single organism almost a perfect mutualism. When we arrange these uh, different forms of mutualism into a spectrum of perfection, our brains are lifted up to think of or imagine a perfect relationship, one that is perfectly mutualistic, where in fact each individual is, is giving an infinite amount of good to another individual, lifts our brains toward the God of Scripture where God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each perfect and good is in such a relationship that they're giving each, uh, each, each, uh, each of the others uh, infinite goodness in that relationship. Uh, as we learn more about mutualism, we realize that uh, the, the low genetic load the low level of disease, relatively low level of disease, suggests that the world really is young, that it really did start out in a perfect form, just like the Bible says, which suggests that the Bible is true, that the God who authored the Bible is true. When we also look at biological evil, we learn, I believe, that uh, we learn something of the 
oh, the holiness of God, the awesomeness of evil. Uh, because what we see is, I think we're all horrified by the natural evil that we see. I know there's some people who like to watch these videos about, you know, a cute little seal sitting there and all of a sudden orca breaks through the ice and, and eats the little feller. And some people who seem to like that. I'm horrified by that. That stuff, ah, that seems wrong. That seems deeply wrong. And it, it suggests to me that the normal state of the world is not that. And that isn't the right way uh, for things to interact. That in fact, uh, when, when natural evil comes in, like predation and things like this, this is a very deep evil, very deep wrong compared to the amazing goodness that pervades for most of the creation. Uh, this suggests to me that God's goodness is incredibly perfect goodness, and our sin is just an awful evil. It's a very, the, 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 the contrast between humans and God is an infinite contrast of great holiness of God and great unholiness of, of humans. Uh, at the same time, I see too that even in God, that holy God, judging sin, right, rightfully destroying sin and judging it, he judged, he cursed the entire creation as a consequence of human sin. But in doing so, he put mercy in there. Even in judgment, God is merciful. Because he didn't just introduce negative effects, the negative effects of the fall. He also introduced evil minimizing effects of the fall that keep that evil from getting out of control. Even in judging, God is merciful in introducing death so that suffering doesn't have to continue forever, so that organisms can stop suffering and in fact be relieved of that suffering. And, it, and, and through all this, being able to study mutualism, being able to study the effects of disease and so on, is, is due to the fact that God created things in such a way we could figure these things out. We could recognize these things. He put goodness into the creation as a picture of his nature, suggesting that this incredible God, this incredibly holy, infinitely powerful, infinitely good God wanted a relationship with us so much that he in fact put illustrations of his nature into the creation so that we could know him. When I realize how good God is, how true he is, how holy he is, how merciful he is, how much he desires even with all that to, to have me know him, I can't help but fall down in worship of him. And in that worship I want to bring other people in to enjoy that worship with me and when I do that, when I study the biological world, learn more about God, consequently, as a consequence, fall into uh, worship of him and want to bring others into worship, then I am fulfilling my obligation, my responsibility as a priest of the creation. And you can do that too. If you study for the rest of your life those things that uh, the biology in such a way to learn more about God, and in the process can't help but uh, fall into worship of him and bring others into worship, you can also fulfill your responsibility as priests of the creation. What about our responsibilities as kings? Our first responsibility as kings is to preserve the goodness that's out there, the goodness that's a picture of the goodness of God. And one way we do this is by reversing the negative effects of the fall, of the curse. Uh, for example, the disease that we see, if it's actually a consequence of the sin ultimately that we committed, then we are justified in reversing that disease, in healing that disease. We are actually responsible for the disease that's out there, even if we personally, I personally, am not responsible for that particular disease. My sin, the sin of humanity, is in fact responsible for bringing disease into the world. It is our responsibility to heal disease whenever we can. Not just physical disease, 
But emotional disease, spiritual disease, when people are suffering in these ways, and they're suffering in any way, we are justified in relieving that, in comforting those who are emotionally suffering, in providing spiritual healing to those who are spiritually suffering, and providing physical healing to those who are physically suffering. It's, uh, it's our responsibility to correct disease, but you know, the traditional way of doing that in the naturalistic world is to kill these little critters that are causing disease. Because again, the naturalistic, in a naturalistic worldview, those organisms that are causing disease are in competition with us. They're trying to kill us off. So in a sense, we should try in a naturalistic worldview to kill them off before they kill us off. It's an arms race. We try the best we can to wipe them out. They're trying to do the best they can to wipe us out. And we fight back and forth. That's what modern medicine does. Modern medicine prescribes antibiotics to kill organisms before those organisms kill us. Uh, modern medicine works to destroy pathogens, evil uh, or disease-causing organisms, before those disease-causing organisms can destroy us. But is that the right, right way to do it? Is there another way to do it? In a young age creationist perspective, those pathogens were once organisms that were in mutualistic relationship with other organisms. They were once not doing any harm to anything else, and in fact doing benefit to other organisms. And something happened, perhaps very law, small changes in their, in their DNA information, that caused them all of a sudden to do more damage than they did good to other organisms. So what if, if that's the case, what if we take that organism and try to figure out how to put it back into its original form? How about if we cure disease by curing the pathogen? If we understand that disease is actually a pathogen that's doing something it's not supposed to do, it's basically sick, and because of its sickness, it's causing sickness in us, what if we heal its disease? What if we restore it to its original form where in fact it was in mutual symbiotic relationship with other things and doing good, not harm? What if rather than killing the organism or trying to kill the organism, we tried to cure the organism? If we cured the pathogen, it would cure us, so it would have the effect we want, which is to heal us, but it would also fulfill our responsibility as kings to take care of the rest of the creation, not just ourselves. It's in fact curing both the pathogen and the victim of the disease. Either way, all of these things, providing healing, curing disease, relieving suffering, is really describing what we now call medicine. This is, uh, is those things that are, that are done by humans for the purpose of relieving uh, suffering and curing disease. It's interesting that I believe this, what I've just described here, is the only real justification that exists for biblical medicine. If you dig into the Bible for justification of medicine, you're going to find, on the one hand, Paul says, take a little wine for your stomach's sake, he says to Timothy, which kind of suggests taking drugs or something like that to, for Timothy. And on the other hand, Hezekiah is condemned for going to the doctors rather than trusting God to heal him. So on the one hand, you've got places in the Bible where it seems to indicate we should go to doctors. I mean, Luke is the writer of one of the Gospels, and he was a doctor. Medicine isn't condemned by the Bible. And, but at the same time, if you trust in doctors rather than God, you are condemned. It's, you would be hard-pressed in searching the Bible from one end to the other to be able to justify modern medicine. Yet, if it's true that disease is something that comes as a result, a negative result of the fall of our sin, then we are justified in reversing the effects, the negative effects of the fall, and thus we're justified in medicine. I believe young age creationism, this perspective on the world, provides the only known justification for medicine from Scripture. 
that if you don't believe in young age creationism, there's no good justification for medicine at all. In addition, young age creationism provides what we call a creation normative to us, to help us make decisions. In curing disease, for example, we have to decide what is disease? What needs to be cured? So what does need to be cured? Is, uh, is being too tall something that should be cured? Is being too fat something that should be cured? What's the normative? What's the right thing? What do we restore things to? I believe the Bible, young age creationist perspective, the Bible gives us a standard because we can look at the world that now exists and then think about or infer the nature of the world before the fall. The world before the fall is the way it should have been. If there's something in the modern world that actually would have been a part of the fall, a pre-fall world, or likely have been a part of the pre-fall world, then it's not justified changing that in the present world. For example, I believe in the pre-fall world, there would have been people of different heights. There would have been people of different, let's say, widths, body sizes, and builds. There would have been people of different skin colors. There would have been uh, a variety of of uh, trees and plants and so on and so forth. So it wouldn't be justified to get rid of the range of skin colors that we have in the present. It wouldn't be appropriate to, uh, to get rid of the range of sizes and shapes of humans that we have in the present. Young Age creationism, by looking back at the pre-fall world, gives us a standard to determine what we should change and what we should not change, a standard which doesn't exist outside of a young age creationist perspective of the world. At the same time, although we are justified in reversing the negative effects of the fall, we are not justified, I would maintain, in reversing the evil minimizing effects of the fall. Those things that God introduced into the creation to minimize the spread of evil, like death and carnivory and natural selection, these are things that are good things in a fallen world. So we shouldn't be taking them out of the current world. We need to leave them in there. A classic example here is our predators. Predators were put into the world at the fall to minimize the evil of the world. It would not be right for us to, minim to, to eliminate predators. I know people want to do that. People want to kill off the wolves because they're attacking your sheep or that sort of thing. But in taking out the predators and taking out the wolves or the coyotes or whatever the predators are in a particular region, you're taking out the organisms that are minimizing the evil uh, the biological evil that's in the prey organisms. So you take out the predator and all of a sudden the deer population uh, will, disease will increase in the deer population because the predators before this were taking out the diseased organisms preferentially. Predators actually make the prey healthier if they don't kill them all off, but if, they, if they're well balanced they make sure that the prey population is healthier than it would be if the predators weren't there. We should not take out the predators because when we do, evil, biological evil will actually increase. So if we ever do, and we have, we've done it in a variety of places, then it becomes our responsibility to take the place of the predator. We're not gonna have to count the number of deer or the number of rabbits or whatever in a particular population and decide when there are too many of them. And we are going to need to take out the, uh, the more diseased ones to make sure that the population remains healthy. So actually, we should back up a little bit and not destroy the predator at all. Then we, they'll do the job that otherwise we would have to do. But if we do destroy the predator, we need to take the responsibility of making those populations healthier. And finally, our responsibility as kings is to enhance the goodness that's already in the creation. I believe God has put even more goodness into the creation than we can see in the creation about us. And he's given us the ability to find that, to find it by breeding and finding new organisms that will, when we discover them, actually enter into these amazing 
uh, mutualistic relationships with other organisms in a, in a way that brings glory to God. And again, was when we discover that, we're going to realize this was made by God. We can't, we can't say, I did this. I did this good thing. It's God. So God will get the glory. God will be glorified in the process. And the goodness of the creation will be enhanced in the process. We have responsibility as kings. The more we learn about biology, the more we have a responsibility to rule as we ought, as God would have us to rule. We need to preserve the goodness of the creation, enhance the goodness of the creation, so that God's glory is increased uh, through time.